Hello friends and neighbors, so a while back I made a video all about canon. What it is, how it works, and the different levels of canon that exist. However, there was one aspect of canon that I didn't have time to delve too deeply into in that video, and I would like to rectify that today. That aspect is headcanons. A quick recap for those of you who didn't see the original video, which actually you should just go watch the original video, but here's the abridged version. Canon is the set of rules and facts that exist in a universe in which a story takes place. These facts come from the creator or creators of the stories, either because they come from the stories themselves, supplemental material that's approved by the creators, or interviews with the creators where they answer questions about the stories. Now these things can answer a lot of questions about a universe, but they can also leave a lot of gaps, and those gaps are often filled by the fans. Sometimes in the form of fan fiction, sometimes in the form of slightly more official fan fiction, and sometimes just in fan theories. And then these theories can be either confirmed or denied by the creator, but until they are, they cannot be considered canon. So headcanon sort of exists in a weird sort of space between canon and not. This idea has evolved considerably, especially in recent years as fans become more and more involved in the stories that they enjoy. But even though the term headcanon has only come into use over the past few years, the idea itself is actually a lot older and may have been around for longer than you think. So I'm going to approach this a little bit differently than I did in the last video about canon. Instead of talking about headcanon in broad strokes, in kind of a general way, I'm actually going to focus on five specific headcanons to illustrate how headcanon has evolved over time. Now, some of these headcanons do predate the term headcanon, and some of them you might not even think of as headcanons, but they all exist in that sort of in-between space between canon and not. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video, so without further ado, let's get started. Headcanon pick number one. The Star Wars Expanded Universe. Now right now, I'm sure hardcore Star Wars fans across the internet are getting ready to comment saying the Expanded Universe is canon, or at least it was canon until Disney got rid of it. Well, okay, but let's talk about this for just a minute here. For anyone who, like me, is sort of a casual Star Wars fan and isn't super familiar with this, let me fill you in real quick. When the original Star Wars trilogy was released, it was evident that George Lucas had created a very rich and detailed universe. But due to the limitations of, well, a movie, there was only so much that the films could actually show us about this universe. Fans had questions about the broader universe. These questions were partially answered at least by the novelizations of the three films, a handful of other novels, and a comic book series. But it wasn't until the early 90s that the series of publications that came to be known as the Expanded Universe really became established with a trilogy of novels known as the Thrawn Trilogy written by Timothy Zahn. The trilogy is set in the years after Return of the Jedi and it's widely credited for re invigorating the Star Wars franchise to the point where George Lucas was inspired to create the prequel trilogy of films. Over the next 20 odd years, a number of stories were published in the form of novels and comics and games and other media, all under the umbrella of the Star Wars Expanded Universe, a series of stories that took place in the years before, during, between, and after the original trilogy and then later the prequel trilogy. All of these stories were monitored and approved by by George Lucas, creating a sort of second tier of canon that Lucas could draw from and contradict as he saw fit. And for many Star Wars fans, this is what Star Wars really is. Though the original six films are and always have been the primary canon for the franchise, they're largely story-based rather than universe-based, and a lot of the decisions that are made in the films are made for visual reasons, because George Lucas is a very visual movie maker. But if you want answers to the questions about the larger universe, questions like, seriously, why does Mace Windu have a purple lightsaber, and you want an answer other than Samuel L. Jackson just wanted to have a purple lightsaber, then you need to turn to the expanded universe. Chances are, if you're looking at a Star Wars encyclopedia or wiki of some kind, and you are getting answers to questions about the history of the Jedi, or how lightsabers work, or different species and whatnot, chances are you're getting information from the expanded universe. So the real question is, how is this headcanon? It sounds like just regular canon. It's the Star Wars Wars universe, it's what everybody acknowledges as the Star Wars universe, and it's even approved by the creator, so that makes it canon, right? Well, kind of, but there are two huge qualifications for this. The first is that the creator, George Lucas, 
doesn't have creative control over Star Wars anymore. He sold the rights to Disney, and it was decided that the only things that would be considered official canon for the Star Wars franchise at this point forward were the original six films, episodes one through six, the animated Clone Wars movie, and the animated Clone Wars television series. As well as, of course, anything created after Disney got the rights to Star Wars. Now, of course, the Expanded Universe stories haven't gone away, but they've been rebranded as Star Wars Legends, a series of stories that is non-canon, but is nonetheless tied to the Star Wars franchise. And this, of course, has made a number of Star Wars fans very angry, which is why I need to be careful here and put a little bit of a disclaimer at the rest of this video. I have a very casual relationship with the Star Wars fandom. I like the movies, but I didn't grow up with them. I didn't even watch the original Star Wars movie until I was in high school, and I didn't know of any of the existence of the expanded universe until I started dating and later married a Star Wars fan. This whole shelf is Star Wars stuff, you may have noticed. It's all hers. And even now, I haven't actually read any of the Expanded Universe material. I plan to, I just haven't yet. And so everything that I know about the Expanded Universe is stuff that I've had to look up. So take what I'm about to say here with a huge grain of salt. I can see both sides of this argument. On the one hand, the Star Wars Expanded Universe is obviously a very large and detailed universe, and throwing it away seems like throwing away years and years of an awful lot of creative work. I can understand the frustration of seeing all of that work being thrown away by Disney for the sake of the story that they want to create. But I can also see it from Disney's point of view. I can understand why they would want to make Star Wars their own, something that they really can't realistically do if they're having to stay true to all of this different work. And this brings us to the second big qualification to the Star Wars Expanded Universe being considered canon, and at this point that Star Wars fans, including my wife, might turn on me a little bit here. So again, take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. It's just my opinion. But the fact of the matter is, even George Lucas never fully embraced the expanded universe as full canon. Think about it, if he had considered the EU full canon, he wouldn't have made it a second tier of canon, he would have made it the primary tier of canon. Lucas's stance on this is basically, let these guys do what they want, as long as it doesn't interfere with what I'm trying to do, it's fine for them to expand their creativity. But it should also be understood that if I want to create a story that contradicts with something that they created, my work comes first. So George Lucas could have easily done exactly what Disney did and create a new Star Wars trilogy that contradicted the expanded universe. And if you don't believe for a minute that George Lucas would have done that if he'd wanted to, I have three words for you. Han shot first. Lucas isn't even above changing his own canon to tell the story he wants to tell, and if he had wanted to tell his own story in the years after Jedi that contradicted the EU, he absolutely would have. Which isn't to say that it wouldn't have been any less infuriating to fans or that they would have accepted it any more than they do now from Disney. Again, Han shot first. That's a bit of Star Wars canon that Lucas has flagrantly contradicted, and yet most fans don't accept it. It's coming from a creator, so technically it is canon that Greedo shot first, and yet fans still insist that Han shot first. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google Han shot first, you'll, you'll find out all about it. And I'm not trying to argue that it's right or wrong for Lucas or Disney to contradict canon here. The only argument that I'm trying to make is that the Star Wars Expanded Universe, or as it's known now, Star Wars Legends, is headcanon at its heart, and it always has been. It's a little bit more official headcanon, and it's maybe not headcanon in the way that we think of it now, but it still exists in that in-between space between canon and not. And regardless of what Disney says, many fans still choose to think of these elements in these stories as canon. And if you think about it, the rebranding of Star Wars Legends is especially fitting here. What's a legend? It's a story that may or may not be based on truth. And it serves the same purposes that headcanons often do. It helps keep the fandom alive, allows fans to exercise their creativity, and allows them to get more deeply into a story that they love. Expanding the Star Wars universe in this way really helped to define it, and it's one of the reasons why even 40 years later, Star Wars is still a pretty big deal. So ultimately, whether or not the Star Wars Expanded Universe is actually canon doesn't matter. It's still meaningful to a lot of fans, and it's part of what makes Star Wars Star Wars. But now that I have alienated all of my Star Wars fans, let's move on to our second pick. Pick number two. Yeah! Eighth Doctor. As we talked about in the canon video, the canon of Doctor Who is 
a hot mess. That's partially due to the plethora of other material released as part of the Doctor Who franchise, including novels, comics, and audio dramas. This extra media, though, proved to be the lifeblood of the Doctor Who franchise in the years between 1989, when the old series was cancelled, and 2005, when the new series premiered. With so many creators writing stories for the Doctor Who franchise, and with no central creator to point to and say they are the keeper of the canon, the canon of Doctor Who is very much in flux, and any consistent aspects of canon are pretty much up to the fans to maintain. This is especially evident when looking at stories about the Eighth Doctor. As you might recall from the Haberdashers' review of the Doctor Who movie, the Eighth Doctor has next to no television appearances. The original series ended with Doctor Number 7, played by Sylvester McCoy, and the new series began with Doctor Number 9, played by Chris Eccleston. And so we have in the middle, Paul McGann playing the Eighth Doctor in the Doctor Who movie, which was originally supposed to be a backdoor pilot to a new American-produced series of Doctor Who. For a variety of reasons, the movie failed in its purpose, and there was no new series at that time. The new series didn't get started until 2005, and when it did, they decided not to use Paul McGann's Doctor, but rather to just start new with a new Doctor. Which, on the one hand, is great, because it gave us Chris Eccleston as the Doctor, who is the very best Doctor, and you will not convince me otherwise. But it did leave Paul McGann's Doctor out in the cold. Fortunately, while the Eighth Doctor hasn't had a lot of television appearances, he is the most prolific Doctor when it comes to appearances in other media. There's a series of novels, a series of comics, and a series of audio dramas, all chronicling some adventures from the Eighth Doctor. Figuring out the canonicity of these stories has proven difficult, not least of which because it's three separate series, each with three separate timelines. And since there is no official creator to keep the canon, the BBC's position on this has basically just been to throw up their hands and say, yeah, guys, do whatever you want except for the British accent. So once again, we have something that exists between canon and not canon, and not really being confirmed either way. Paul McGann actually lends his voice to the audio dramas, and in the second television appearance of his, the short webisode, The Night of the Doctor, he makes reference to companions and events from those audio dramas. So parts of the audio drama canon, at least, have crept into the television canon, but there are still contradictions in the stories. And I have to offer the same disclaimer here that I offered in the Star Wars segment, that I haven't actually experienced any of these stories from the Eighth Doctor. I only know Paul McGann's incarnation of the Doctor from his two television appearances as well as anything that I've happened to look up, so I'm not totally invested in these stories. But I do still consider Paul McGann's Eighth Doctor stories to be headcanon. Because so many elements of these stories contradict each other, fans have to pick and choose which elements of the Eighth Doctor stories they're going to consider canon. And because Doctor Who's canon is so loose and open to begin with, that's pretty easy to do. The stories about the Eighth Doctor did fulfill a major role in Doctor Who. Just like the Star Wars Expanded Universe, they helped to keep the fandom alive, and they provided more information about the world than we could get from the primary source material. But just like the Star Wars Expanded Universe, they still don't quite mesh with the primary source material material for Doctor Who, and so fans and creators can accept or disregard elements as they see fit. But the Eighth Doctor stories go even one step further than the Star Wars Expanded Universe, in that they're not just expanding a universe, but they're actually expanding a character. The character of the Doctor as a whole is fascinating, his individual incarnations are fascinating, and the Eighth Doctor is particularly fascinating for a number of reasons. He's the first Doctor to have an on-screen kiss, he claims that he's half-human on his mother's side, which is another source of contradictions between the various stories. And and he was the Doctor who was around when the Time War started, and the Doctor who made the decision to drop the name of the Doctor in order to end the Time War. The television appearances show us the beginning of this Doctor's journey and the end of this Doctor's journey, and so the Eighth Doctor stories get to see this character evolve from that first on-screen kiss to that last major difficult decision. And of course it gives us a deeper look at the personality of the Doctor as a whole, with Paul McGann representing one facet of his overall personality. And because there is so much contradiction between the various stories, fans get to have the final say of which aspects of this character they get to accept. So now we've looked at two stories that I know about but haven't really invested myself in, so let's now turn to a fandom that I have invested a lot of my time in. Pick number three. 
Harry Potter fan theories. So I realize that a lot of my viewers are younger and may not have come to the Harry Potter fandom until after the series was fully released. So you may not have a concept of what it was like to wait for the next Harry Potter book to be published. Or maybe you do, because thanks to Harry Potter, a lot of book series have that same hype surrounding release dates now, but back when Harry Potter was being released, that sort of thing really wasn't a thing. So it's kind of like waiting for the next Game of Thrones book to come out, except with the expectation that the next book will actually be released. George R. R. Martin is never going to release the next Game of Thrones book. Let's just accept that reality and move on. Suffice to say, though, that waiting for the next installment of the Harry Potter series to be published could be brutal, especially after Goblet of Fire was released. The first three books in the Harry Potter series didn't have as much hype surrounding them yet, and they were all pretty self-contained and episodic. Goblet of Fire was the first Harry Potter book that didn't have a neat resolution, ending with the death of a student, the return of Lord Voldemort, and the Ministry of Magic's complete refusal to accept this fact. So the need to read the next Harry Potter book became much more urgent after that, and in the intervening time, fans began to speculate on what would happen in the next book. There began to be speculations on who would die, who would end up with whom, and how Harry Potter would ultimately defeat Voldemort. This frenzy was helped along by three major factors. First was the way that the books were written themselves, usually with little hints being dropped throughout the story of what would happen both later in the book and later in the series. It was evident from the way that J.K. Rowling wrote her series that she had the whole thing planned out in advance, and it was even more obvious after Goblet of Fire was released. Second was the fact that J.K. Rowling was the biggest troll about this. She loved watching fans of her books speculate on what was going to happen later in the series, and she even dropped little hints herself and watched people pounce on them. I mean, does anyone remember J.K. Rowling's original website? That thing was like a mystery in and of itself. It was so cool to go through and try to figure everything out in there, and you could learn more about what might happen in the series as well. And the last was the growing popularity of the internet, which provided a forum not just for J.K. Rowling to communicate these things with her fans, but for fans to communicate with each other and discuss and expound upon these theories. In fact, I have in my my possession. The Ultimate Unofficial Guide to the Mysteries of Harry Potter. Anyone else remember this book? This book was published in between books four and five of the Harry Potter series, and it is basically a chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of the first four books, parsing each and every clue that is dropped, showing it to its eventual resolution, and then using that information to predict what would happen both in book five and in the remainder of the Harry Potter series. And let me just say, now that the series has been fully released, reading some of these theories is hilarious. One theory that they were particularly adamant about in this book is the idea that Remus Lupin and James Potter performed a switching spell and actually switched bodies shortly before Voldemort killed James, which meant that James Potter was actually alive in Remus Lupin's body. This was an actual theory that people actually believed. Also, Snape is a vampire. Now, of course, the series is complete, and J.K. Rowling is expanding even more about the Harry Potter universe with the Pottermore website and the release of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And yet, fan theories still abound. Theories like the idea that Draco Malfoy is a werewolf, that Dumbledore may have created his own horcrux, and that Felix Felicis, Liquid Luck, doesn't actually do anything. Theories that involve deep reading, what some might call overthinking, of certain elements of the Harry Potter series. And it's worth noting that none of these theories fundamentally change the Harry Potter series as a whole. You can disregard them and it won't change anything in the plot, but reading this series with these theories in mind does kind of enhance certain elements of the stories and the characters. And this is a perfect example of books belonging to their readers, because many of these theories have been debunked by J.K. Rowling. But just as with the whole Han shot first thing with George Lucas, fans don't seem to care that much. Fans will continue to come up with these fan theories and believe them regardless of what the creator says. In fact, the Harry Potter community pretty much exists because of these fan theories, and I think this is pretty much where the term headcanon came from in the first place. So now we've gotten to the point where headcanons have moved beyond official media and into the realm of the fans, who are creating their own answers to questions about the universe. And now we're going to take this concept one step further. Pick number four, the Pixar theory. 
I don't actually have a Pixar-related t-shirt, so this shirt with all the Disney villains on it will, will have to do. I absolutely love the Pixar theory. Not just as a theory, but just as a creative piece of headcanon in general. If you're unfamiliar with the Pixar theory, it was first conceived by John Negroni and has since been refined and expanded upon by a number of fans, most notably the Super Carlin Brothers, who have made a number of videos about theories concerning Pixar, whether it concerns the Pixar theory or just theories within other movies, as well as theories concerning a lot of the Harry Potter things that we talked about earlier. Essentially, it is this theory that all of the Easter eggs and references to other Pixar movies that exist in these movies are actually an indication that all of these movies exist in the same universe. And you might be thinking, okay, yeah, they exist in the same universe, big deal, Matt, but there's more to it than that. Using these Easter eggs as clues, Negroni believes that each of the Pixar movies are actually a part of one giant story told out of order. A story about the development of magic and superpowers, of sentient animals and living toys, of the fall of humankind in a three-wave struggle between humans, animals, and artificial intelligence. And it is awesome. The Pixar theory has become such a cult phenomenon that now every time a new Pixar movie is released, fans look for clues and develop their own theories of how this movie fits into the larger Pixar story. Now part of the fun of watching a Pixar movie is looking for these clues and figuring out how they connect to the larger story. This is kind of headcanon at its peak. The other headcanons that we've talked about are expanding existing universes and looking more deeply into them. This headcanon, though, is actually creating its own universe. And Pixar has neither confirmed nor denied this theory. Their stance on the whole thing seems to be, oh, oh, you, you think the stories are connected, do you? How interesting. They seem content to allow their fans to continue to develop this theory, and why shouldn't they? It makes their movies seem so much cooler, and they're already pretty cool to begin with. And real talk for a minute. How likely is it that the Pixar theory is actually real? Honestly, not very. In reality, Pixar movies tend to operate on very similar themes, and they do like putting references to their other movies and Easter eggs in their films. They may have had it in mind that certain elements of the universe do exist, like Pizza Planet and Buzz Lightyear toys and by and large, but the idea that they had this grand overarching story in mind when they started creating these movies is probably a fiction in and of itself. Fans of the Pixar theory, even if they won't admit it, probably know that this is true. But here's the thing. No one cares! It doesn't matter whether the Pixar theory is true or not, it's just fun to speculate. It's fun to make up this brand new story and keep tweaking it and refining it and adding new details to it. It's fun to dive more deeply into these stories, to speculate on certain characters or certain elements. And for many, if not most of us, it makes for a much more enjoyable and richer viewing experience. The Pixar theory has even bled into other aspects of the Pixar films, and there are theories concerning who Andy's monster might be, and whether Riley was adopted, and how the emotions or the living toys work. There are even some theories connecting elements of the Disney animated canon. There's a theory that Tarzan is actually related to Anna and Elsa from Frozen. There's a theory that Jane might be a distant descendant from Belle. And honestly, it's gotten to the point where we don't even need confirmation from the Pixar creators of whether these theories are real. Honestly, I don't even think we want them. Pixar surely knows us, which is why they're so aloof about the whole thing. Why is Sully a good thing? So at this point, it would seem that head cannons have pretty much reached their peak. We've gone from the very controlled second tier of canon from Star Wars Expanded Universe to the Eighth Doctor stories that fit within an open canon to Harry Potter fan theories where the canon is created by the fans to the Pixar theory where the fans are actually creating their whole new universe and story. And yet, there's still one headcanon that we need to talk about, and we're going to go out of order with this one because this isn't a new headcanon. In fact, it's a very, very old one. Pick number five. Religion. Okay, so right now I'm sure that a lot of people are getting ready to start commenting, so let me start off by saying that I am not saying this to be in any way dismissive or disrespectful to anyone's religious beliefs. But think for a minute about what religion really is. Not faith or spirituality, but religion. It's a set of rules and practices surrounding a particular faith, and it is often based on the interpretation 
of scripture. Think about how many different denominations or variants there are of various faiths. They come from different interpretations of the key scripture. So think of the faith or the scripture as canon. Religion, then, would be the headcanon. If the belief in God or an all-powerful deity of some kind is canon, then how we choose to express that belief would be headcanon. Religion, by and large, is how we fill in the gaps of our knowledge about the universe. It's how we answer those unanswerable questions. It's just that instead of the question being, did Han shoot first, or is Draco Malfoy a werewolf, the question is, what's the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What's going to happen to me when I die? It's doing for the actual universe what Harry Potter fan theories do for the Harry Potter universe. It's the ultimate headcanon. Let's look at a couple of examples, and these examples are both going to come from Christianity just because it's the religion that I was raised in, not because I believe it's superior in any way. There are two practices that are considered sacred across pretty much all denominations of Christianity, baptism and communion. Baptism is considered the entryway into Christianity, and really all we have to go on here is descriptions of baptism in the Bible, most particularly John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River. And so everyone has different ideas about how baptism should work and what it actually does. Many denominations believe that because baptism is the entryway into Christianity, an unbaptized child, if they die, will not gain entrance into heaven. And so they try to baptize infants as soon after their birth as possible. However, some denominations believe that they should wait until the child can make their own decision of whether or not they want to be baptized, and they'll pair baptism with confirmation or entryway into membership of the church, which occurs around age 12 or 13. And some will even wait until the child is a full adult to baptize them. There's also some disagreement over how baptism should be carried out. In the Bible, John the Baptist was actually dunking people in the river, and some denominations do choose to perform baptism in this way, but this is considered to be a little extreme, especially for infants, and so some churches choose to sprinkle or pour water over the child's head. Everyone interprets baptism in a little bit different way, and there's no one right way to do it. The other sacrament is communion, the act of remembering Jesus' sacrifice by reenacting his Last Supper through the eating and drinking of bread and wine. Or wafers and grape juice, as the case may be. Again, we have very little to go on, basically just the story of the Last Supper, where Jesus compares his body and blood to bread and wine, feeds it to his disciples, and says, do this in remembrance of me. Communion has become the centerpiece of many Christian services. It's basically what we have built our services around, even though a lot of churches don't perform communion every week. Some do it every other week, some do it every month, and some really play it fast and loose and only do it every other month. And that's just one of the opinions concerning communion that differs among different churches and denominations. Some believe that the bread and wine literally becomes Jesus' body and blood as you eat it, and others believe that the act is merely symbolic. Sometimes communion is performed dipping the bread into the wine, sometimes it's performed with an altar call, and sometimes they replace the wine with grape juice. They're all different interpretations on the same words. And the thing that ultimately makes religion work is the same thing that makes headcanons work. Belief. Just as fans believe in the Star Wars Expanded Universe, or the Eighth Doctor stories, or Harry Potter fan theories, or the Pixar theory, people believe in the religion that they practice. None of this is to say that there's no truth in faith or in these religious practices or to discount it in any way. Quite the contrary, actually. Headcanons have to operate on faith because they exist in that in-between space between canon and not. They have no official confirmation from a creator. Or the creator's word has been found in some way to be unreliable, Hanshot first. The thing that makes faith what it is is the simple fact that there's no way to prove that it's true. There's no way to prove that there is an all-powerful creator, or that Jesus rose from the dead, or that baptism is the gateway into heaven. If there was a way to prove these things is true, they'd be facts. And headcanon exists in the same realm. They are unproven or unconfirmed theories, and many of them are going to stay that way. And yet we believe them anyway, and that's what gives these theories power in the same way that faith gives religion power. And this is worth emphasizing because the biggest difference between headcanons and faith is that we don't go to war over headcanons. I mean, it was touch and go with the Harry Hermione shippers there for a while, but by and large, it doesn't happen. People understand that headcanons aren't truth, that different people are going to have different interpretations and different ideas that others can either accept or discard as they see fit, but all of them are worthy of consideration. 
and they're interesting to talk about and to contemplate, and I think that people could benefit from thinking of religion in a similar way. Because who's to say that these elements of faith are true or not? Certainly not me, certainly not anybody. Most, if not all, religious strife can be traced back to people treating their religious beliefs as truth and not as belief. They're treating their headcanon as actual canon and not allowing for an open conversation that might include other ideas. So whatever your religious beliefs might be, I would implore you to remember that they're not canon. That doesn't mean that there's no truth in them or that they aren't important in any way, but you cannot prove that they are absolutely true. There's more than one way to look at things. There's more than one headcanon for the universe. So at this point, I think I've managed to alienate Star Wars fans, Doctor Who fans, Harry Potter fans, Pixar fans, and anyone who believes in God. I think I've done well. Thanks for joining me for this video on headcanons. Be sure to tell me what some of your favorite headcanons are in the comment section, as well as what you thought about what I said in this video and any of your sensibilities that I may have offended. If you would like to see my original video on canon, you can click right here to see that. And if you would like to see a little bit more about fan theories, I would highly recommend that you check out the Super Carlin Brothers channel. They talk about the Pixar theory, as well as Harry Potter fan theories, Star Wars theories, a lot of the things that we've talked about here. Their whole channel is basically built up around headcanons, and so I would definitely encourage you to check out their channel as well as subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and like this video. And over here is a picture of Rita Hayworth. What's that doing there?